This is the Resilient Advisor Podcast. My name is Jay Coulter. On this episode, I'm going to interview Frank LaRosa, who's the CEO of Elite Consulting Partners and host of the popular podcast, The Financial Advisors Advisor. And on this episode, we're going to talk about how advisors can build an M&A plan that they can actually execute on. Franks, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. As a fellow podcaster, it's always great to have other podcasters on because you know how hard these shows are to produce. But what I love about this one is I didn't even have to script out notes because this is a topic on the top of mind of all advisors. Yeah, totally. You know, this inorganic growth has been, uh, is, has been a hot topic for probably five years now. Execution has just been the challenge. Walk us through it. Yeah, sure. No problem. And, and again, it's, uh, it's something that's talked about all the time. So, um, you know, we can take this in, in uh, any direction you want. But, you know, I think that when we work with advisors, uh, you know, advisors in, in the retail world, so the captive world, like W2 world, it's, um, there's sort of one, one way to execute, um, which tends to be a little more challenging. Uh, but in the uh, independent space of the, or the RIA space, um, there's a bigger pond of fish in. So you have to, figure out how to make yourself uh, competitive, right? You have to know what your story is. You have to know what your value prop is. Um, you have to know what you're trying to get accomplished. Uh, so one of the questions that I tend to ask all of my clients is what do you want to be when you grow up, right? And that means, okay, so you have a five or six person office. You want to get it to what? Well, how are you going to get there? And one inevitably what they say is we want to acquire practices. We want to go out and, you know, by retiring advisors or, you know, they have these <clears throat> lots of, some of them pipe dreams. Right. Um, and you start getting into the weeds on, you know, okay, so what's that plan? You know, and there are, one answer I get a lot of times is, well, uh, you know, we're not sure yet, uh, but there's a couple of guys in our marketplace that we think uh, are going to retire soon. So we're going to, we're going to go after them and they don't have a plan, you know? So, okay. So if you run into that guy tomorrow, and he says, gee, that sounds like a great idea. I might have interest in a, in a succession. What do you have in mind? If they don't have anything in mind when they get the opportunity, they're going to miss it, right? And so one of the things that I, sort of the first thing I talk about is they need to have a plan in place at the very beginning. Um, and that plan has to, <clears throat> has to be from, you know, how to execute, right? How to execute on going after those advisors, from, from a point of view of, of their firm and what's the impact on their firm. But then they also have, a have, they have to have the same plan from the point of view of the incoming advisor. Right? So whether, whether that's someone that's going to retire in two or three years or whether that's someone that's going to roll into their practice and be part of their brand. Right. So right? Frank, let me, uh, let me interrupt you. Let, let's get granular with this in specific. So okay. let's say I'm an advisor. I'm an independent hybrid advisor and I have I know, a four-person office. I'm in my mid 40s and I want to grow organically, which I've got a program in place for that, but I'm looking at some inorganic growth. Right. right? Walk me through your process. So, we're going to look at the first thing I want to ask that advisor is okay, so I'm a $500,000 producer, right? Why should I roll into your office? What makes you so special? Because everybody oh. thinks that they have some special sauce, mm -hmm. but, uh, and they might, and they might. But if they don't know how to articulate it and they don't know how to sell it to, to the new advisor, they, it doesn't even get out of the gate. So that's the first question is understand, do they understand what they're bringing to the table? So really the value proposition. So let's right. stop there. What are some of the better value propositions that you've seen, whether it's pricing, partners, resources that are available? What, what are some of the better combinations of that that you've seen help advisors attract M&A opportunities? Right. So what, what I've seen, because there's lots of different iterations of that. So, but what I've seen uh, be the most uh, sort of resonate the most with advisors is coming into an office where it's fully operational. So here's your office. Uh, here's uh, Julie. She's your sales assistant. Uh, here's where the printer is. Here's the kitchen. We take care of everything for you. you. You know, all we want you to do is focus on your clients, bringing new, bringing new assets in and, don't worry about the, the rent, the utilities, 
any of that stuff. And we're going to pay you uh, 65 to 70% payout and you don't have to worry about anything. Um, that to me is what resonates the most with people. Um, especially if you're talking about advisors coming from the retail side of the business. Mm -hmm. you know, if you look at some of the news just this, this week, um, UBS cha made some compensation changes. Wells Fargo uh, made some compensation changes on, on accounts under uh, $250,000 and below. And so in a lot of those cases, you can have an advisor go from a 35% payout, right? To a 65% payout. Mm -hmm. And it's going from W2 to 1099. So what a lot of those advisors want is simplicity. Okay, I'm going to walk into my, my new office on, on Monday. What, do I, what am I responsible for? And if you say to them, nothing but just taking care of your clients, mm -hmm. that's what resonates. So let's uh, talk about at a high level, the margins in that for the operator. So when you provide that type of platform, you obviously have already laid out the capital. You have the process in place. You have the office, the assistants. They're coming in at, and let's just use the 70% number you did. Well, there's operating costs there. So the margins have to get pretty skinny. Is that going to be a viable model when we enter in the next bear market? That's a great question. Um, and, I, and I think it is. You know, if you're, look, you're, you're not, the, the goal here is to, you're not going to make your fortune on, <clears throat> on that incoming producer. Um, but if you've negotiated a good top line rate for yourself, where you're getting a 90% payout, maybe higher, but let's just argue, let's just say it's 90%, and you're paying that advisor 70%, um, every, every dollar of revenue that that new advisor brings in, so you're picking up 20, 20 points, and, and yes, they're using some of your assistant, and yes, they're using more ink cartridges, and yes, they're using some office space, um, but it's 20 points on a half a million dollar producer, right? So, you, you, you have room in there. Um, you also have room if the market goes down, right? But it's not all about that, right? You have to make, so you're picking up a hundred grand on a guy doing, on, on a guy doing $500,000. Um, you want to make sure that that guy's the right fit, which we can get into culture also, because you might bring a hundred grand in and it might, and it might cost you a lot more than that because right. they're, they're challenging, right? Um, I had a meeting yesterday with a, with a team and that was one of the things that we were talking about. Who, who do they bring into their new firm um, that fits the right model? Uh, but, you know, I think that you end up getting more scale if you bring those, those producers in and every producer you bring in, it takes the cost of your assistant and spreads it out across a, a, a number, a greater number of advisors, more revenue. Um, because she, you know, she or he as an assistant is a fixed cost. Your rent's a fixed cost. Your utilities, for the most part, are fixed costs, right? And so if you can pick up, even if you're picking up thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 for every producer you bring in, I mean, one producer could, could be all you need to cover your rent, right? So that's how you have to look at it. You can't look at it like, oh, I'm going to, my job is going to be to bring in producers and I'm, and I'm going to make more money off of them than off of my own book. That's, that's the greedy way to look at it. That's not the way you want to look at it. You so want to look I at it. Can, can I be devil's advocate on that for a minute? Sure. Because absolutely. I have these conversations regularly like you do and an advisor yeah. will say, yeah, you know, I think I want to go out and acquire books of business or bring advisors on. And so when you go through the math, right, if they're going to get that extra, say $30,000 a year, you know, that, that's $3 million in new assets. If they just went out and found, you know, three, four clients that generated the same amount of revenue, that's a whole lot less headaches than an advisor. What do you say to the folks that look at it through that lens? Where, where are they wrong? Where am I wrong? Yeah, I, I, I would say where you're wrong is you can do both, right? Because you can still go out and find your $3 million in, in client revenue. Uh, but if you brought the right advisors in, and, and I emphasize the right advisors, that's a key to your point. Um, they're also bringing in, in, in new assets. So I don't want to call it like clipping a coupon because I, I don't mean it that way. But if you have an advisor that's a consistent, good individual, they're respectful, they fit well into your culture, they're not a headache, they just want to service their clients. They get along with everybody else in the office. 
and they're bringing 30 or 40 thousand dollars to the bottom line and you can multiply that times two or three producers and you bring one a year in now all of a sudden you're not making 30 or 40 thousand dollars on your on your advisors you're making one hundred fifty thousand dollars over time and that's above and beyond what you're doing as a producer um, one of the things that you might not a lot of firms are moving towards this. Most firms are moving towards this, but but years ago, the responsibility for oversight, which is maybe where you're coming from, fell on on you as the practice owner. In today's day and age, most of the time, the firms that you're affiliated with, they're doing the oversight. So there's actually very little. There's some, but not as much as it used to be supervision and responsibility that you as a practice as the owner of the practice has to be concerned about so you're not um doing all of their trade blotter reviews and their email correspondent reviews and, and all that stuff uh what you're there for is to make sure that he that he or she is getting their questions answered making sure that our clients are coming in everything's being documented that the the standard folders that are required to be in any office are being handled the right way um, and if you're good at, at hiring people, you have a really strong administrator that's doing that, right? So you become the um, sort of the big picture individual. Your, your job as the business owner is to, is to set the tempo and the pace of the office and look at the big picture. Make sure that they're doing marketing stuff. Make sure that the, everybody in the office is, is doing what they're supposed to be doing in terms of branding and going out and doing seminars and finding the three and four and five million dollars in net new assets to bring in. <clears throat> your your point of view is sort of black or white, right? You can't do one, you can only do one or the other. Mm -hmm. And my contention is you you can do both. And if you hire the right way, that becomes very easy. Okay. Right? Um, so, so we were that's that's the biggest thing is you have to be as an as an acquirer. You have to be willing to walk away from revenue, even though it could be quick revenue to come into the branch. If it doesn't fit what your core values are for the office and your and your mission and what you're in the culture of your office, you should walk away from it because it will take more time off out of your day. It will stress you out. It'll keep you, it'll keep you up at night worrying about what that individual is doing, especially if they're a more transaction based advisor where they have to be sort of grinding in and out all the time. Um, <clears throat> you have to be really, really careful about who you're, who you're hiring um, because it's much more difficult to sort of uh, part ways uh, once they're in the office. Uh, so um, you can do both. You just have to do it the right way. So Frank, let's, uh, let's skip over culture. Uh, I've covered that on past episodes. Sure. And let's get to the meat of really what, advisors tuning into this episode want to know, how do I actually go out and find these folks? So in the example from earlier, you know, I'm a four person office. I decide I, I buy into your philosophy. I'm going to go out and recruit advisors. What do I do? What's step one? I would say step one in that whole process is, um, you, well, you should be in, in today's day and age, you should be on social media. You should have an image in your community. Um, you should be doing doing things that put your name out in the in the community where someone that is thinking about making a change saw your name somewhere. They saw you um, they saw you at an event. They saw you hosting a, a charity event. They see you online, right? So they, they see that you're doing a lot of um, social media content. Those are important. Uh, picking up the phone, I know in, 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 in today's t technological age and social media, picking up the phone and just calling your target advisors and saying, hey, I'd love to buy you a cup of coffee and talk to you about the firm that I'm building and how you might fit into that and really help benefit you and your clients. Just grab a cup of coffee. Um, one of the things that I used to do as a manager is I bought uh, Starbucks. So this is, a, you're going to want to write this one down because <clears throat> this was a tremendous success. So I had a, a target group of advisors that I wanted to go after, bigger producers in our marketplace. 
and I bought uh, the nice um, star, you know, these Starbucks cups, the nice big heavy Starbucks cups. Put them in a box. Uh, put my business card in the box, and on the back of the card, I put, "Would love to buy you a cup of coffee to talk about an opportunity at my office." Um, I laminated the business card. Um, because I think people put laminated cards in their wallets more so than non-laminated. And I sent it to their house. Um, and it did a couple of things. It got, it got calls back because that was a unique approach. So they wanted to meet me just because I was willing to do something like that. Um, or when I wanted to call them, it made it real easy for me to get through the screener, right? Because I just, when the assistant answered the phone, I just said, can you just let them know uh, it's a gentleman that sent them the coffee cup? And, and I got through to 100% of the people that I called. So 100%. 100%. 100%. Um, some of them, look, not all of them were interested. Some of them were saying, hey, look, I just wanted to talk to the person that came up with the idea of sending me a coffee cup because my two daughters and my wife were arguing about who gets to use it, right? Um, <clears throat> and every time they use that coffee cup at home, they think of me. And the reason I use a Starbucks cup and not, you know, the name of my company, some logo, right? Because they'll take that cup and they'll either throw it out. It doesn't become useful. But if it's a Starbucks cup, everyone's going to keep it. So you, you're paying a little bit of money, but it's worth it. So that's one thing. Um, you should be working at, you should be contacting the resources at your firm to see what they are doing. You know, do they use a discovery database? So Discovery is, a, is an online database that has listings of every single producer in the business, broker, you know, individual, indi independent broker dealers, retail guys, RIAs. Um, talk to your firm about what resources that they have to uh, help you recruit and acquire practices. Uh, work with firms like mine that will help on a retainer basis. So we will work with some clients on a retainer basis to go and target a specific market uh, for advisors that they're looking for. And we will use our database, which has hundreds of thousands of people in it, and narrow down what they're looking for. So if you're looking for succession plans, we're gonna target advisors at a certain age and above, right? That have been in the business at a certain time because the, the pitch is gonna be a little bit different. Um, you, you can narrow that field down. You may only have three or 400 people in your marketplace. so you should also start working on campaigns, um, you know, sort of direct mail campaigns. Sending out, I see the back on, on your desk there, you have a holiday card, it looks like. Send out holiday cards. Send out, um, you know, I, I do that currently. So if we, we have a, I'll call it our sort of our target um, top 10 clients that we're, that we're trying to work with, uh, we send them holiday uh, gifts just as a, hey, you know, look forward to talking to you next year. If, if there's anything you need from us, please give me a call. You need to be dripping on them because they'll, you want to be the person when they think about, you know, maybe it's time for me to start thinking about an exit strategy. You want to be the person that touched them the most because you're going to be front of mind. Um, the, the other strategy, it's, it's not so much a strategy as, as an idea that I think everyone misses when they talk about succession planning. Instead of going to the marketplace with, with just finding advisors that are ready to retire, you should be going to the marketplace and talking to a single, single producers, right? Sole practitioners and saying to them, who is your contingency plan? You know, cause his clients or her clients are thinking about, well, Jay, if you get hit by a bus, what happens to you? What happens to my, my accounts? And you'd be shocked how many advisors don't have an answer to that. So what you want to do is it's like long ball. Go to that advisor and say, look, I'd, let, let, I'd like to be that person for you in our community. We all know the same people. And if you said to them, well, you know, if something happens to me, you know, Frank over at Elite is going to take over all the accounts. And you know Frank and he's coach football and blah, blah, blah. Um, that gives them a sense of uh, comfort and it's, you're not asking them to join the firm right this second, right? But over time, as you develop that relationship, inevitably they'll say, you know what, maybe we should think about doing this now and coming into the practice and starting that transition practice now. So a lot of it just has to do with how you approach 
you, the advisors in your marketplace, you got to have a story. You have to know how they're going to transition into your office because that's really important because that's what they want to hear about. And it really is just sort of old school, shaking hands and kissing babies, picking up the phone, introducing yourself, um, just meeting for a cup of coffee because you, we all know this, right? The, the, this industry changes so much, so fast that you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. And so you might as well know who your one, who your competitors are in the marketplace. Um, but who's out there that can help you? Cause you might need the same thing. Maybe you're, you're a sole practitioner and you don't have a contingency plan in place. Just an easy story to, to go to the market with, to start a conversation. And then you tell them, how great you are and how great your support staff is and how great your technology is. And you know what? Maybe you should just think about rolling into the office and I'll give you a 70% payout. You don't have to worry about anything. Um, that, that resonates a lot. If I didn't your question or not, but. So Frank, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. How could listeners find out more about elite consulting partners? Awesome. They can go to our website, of course, which is elite consulting partners.com. Uh, they can check out our podcast at the Financial Advisors Advisor. Um, they can also go to Elite Consulting Partners on the YouTube channel. And they can check us out there and they can see how we, uh, how we go about doing all this stuff. But I, I appreciate you uh, having me come on and talk about this topic that is discussed on a daily basis. Yeah. Thanks for coming on, Frank. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult an attorney or tax advisor. Resilient Wealth LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Resilient Wealth and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For Resilient Wealth information, please visit Investment Advisors Public Disclosure website at www.advisorinfo.sec.gov by searching Resilient Wealth CRD number 30.